Hello everyone, my name is Kati Hyppä. We are here in our studio home in East Berlin. I work here with my partner Niklas Roy, who is behind the camera. We make projects which are somewhere between art, technology and maker culture. Our workbench includes drilling machines, pliers, screwdrivers, hot glue, soldering irons, an oscilloscope, a sewing machine and much more. With these tools and various different types of materials we build installations and objects which often have a geeky look and a playful character. To celebrate the 10-year anniversary edition of Sharing is Caring, in this presentation I will look back at some projects that were inspired by open cultural content from museums and archives. I wish to share with you my experiences in how digital items such as images and sound can land on the physical workbench and become part of multi-material creative practices. In 2014, I took part in an open culture hackathon called Coding Da Vinci, which is organized here in Berlin. As I went there, I discovered a very welcoming, enthusiastic, happy atmosphere so it was easy to get excited about the open collections. Although I knew already something about open collections because I had worked with them previously at the Media Lab Helsinki. So that made it really easier also to enter the hackathon. I was particularly impressed by the amazingly high resolution scans of insect boxes which the local natural history museum had provided for the hackathon. And I was zooming into this large, large files that my computer was almost crashing when I was opening them. But I found a really gorgeous beetle called the Atlas beetle that I really wanted to work on. After the initial meeting at the hackathon, I returned to the workbench. I worked several weeks with different kinds of materials like wood and electronics. And the outcome was Cyber Beetle, who resides in his personal wooden insect box. He gets occasionally out to make a walk or to watch entertainment programs on his flat screen TV, which he has on the back of his box. The animation on his TV was made using photos from Berlin's Botanical Museum along with some animal sounds from the Natural Histories collection. My brother Tommy turned these sounds into a Cyber Beetle song, which is the soundtrack of the video. But at the beginning of the project, it wasn't really clear what was exactly going to come out of it, because all I had was a vague vision. So gradually, all the materials came together step by step doing little experiments, such as testing a walking mechanism or an infrared sensor. And some experiments were more successful than others, but that's how it always is. There were absolutely no practical goals with Cyber Beetle. There was really just a desire to bring this imaginary character alive. And had there been some practical goals, Cyber Beetle would probably never have been born. Eventually, Cyber Beetle returned to his roots at Berlin's Natural History Museum when he was scanned to their insect collection. He even made a TV appearance at the German children's program called Erde an Zukunft. But Cyber Beetle was not designed to be shown in events or exhibitions. In fact, demonstrating him requires quite some careful tinkering with switches and batteries or otherwise it might turn into a smoky ride. Oh. In later open content projects, I took practicalities related to exhibitions also better into account. 
Forbidden Fruit Machine is an installation which enables people to interact with a 16th century painting with a popular 80s gaming joystick. This project we made together with Niklas on our free time using largely materials that we have here at home, some of which are recycled from old projects. We have actually quite a large material archive of our own, with lots and lots of boxes tacked with metadata. The idea for the installation emerged when I was thinking rather generally what kind of physical objects could be made from images of old paintings, as there are many such items in open collections. So in this case, it was the medium, an oil painting, in contrast to the contemporary media formats, which inspired the work, rather than a specific collection. The painting chosen for the installation was The Fall of Man by Cornelis Cornelison van Haarlem, which is part of the Rijksmuseum's open collection. It depicts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where the serpent is tempting them to eat the forbidden fruit. This theme provided a familiar narrative, which we could build upon. Furthermore, the various characters in the painting provided elements which could be explored with the joystick, like targets on a game. <laughs> The sounds used in the installation were from Free Sound, Free Music Archive and Internet Archive, which we use frequently to find audio files for our projects. Forbidden Fruit Machine has visited different events. At Mega Fair Berlin, we were positively surprised when lots and lots of children queued up to engage with Van Halen's 16th century masterpiece. Hmm? Always wear safety gear when giving conference presentations. Later in 2015, I had the pleasure to be part of the Mix It Up exhibition in which artists and designers remixed the open collection of SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark. I chose to work with an image of Wilhelm Hammershoi's painting called Interior in Strandgade, Sunlight on the Floor, from 1901. It is one of the major works in the museum's collection. The painting is characterized by an intriguing dreamy light shining through a window, which is a recurring theme in Hammershoi's works. Looking at the painting, I imagined how time would pass in the room. Following this very immediate powerful impression, I built a small electromechanical machine called As Light Goes By. It recreates the light coming through the window and moves the light pattern across the floor over and over again through a self-switching motor mechanism. Seeing the little machine in the exhibition at SMK next to the original painting was very special and naturally also a great honor. In fact, as light goes by, wouldn't be much anything without the original painting by its side, as it relies on the shared appreciation of the atmosphere in Hammes Hoy's painting. What is common to all these past projects is that they were built using a mixture of different materials and techniques, such as woodwork, electronics, 3D printing, and of course, hot gluing. They all reanimate digital archival items, which traveled from the computer screen to the maker's head, from the head to the hands, and eventually back to the physical world where the items originated. But the journey does not end there, as the projects are also documented online. Following the practices of makers all over the internet, we share images, videos, circuit schematics and other materials of our projects. We have learned a lot from others and we also like to contribute our share. Accustomed to using open licenses, we publish our materials so that others can reuse them. However, it seems that open licenses such as Creative Commons licenses are not always compatible with existing publishing policies and conventions in the art world. There may be existing content systems, artist contracts 
and other procedures which don't include the option to use an open license. Yet, wouldn't it be desirable to have more open content also from artists who are still alive? We can already learn a lot about open practices from the maker and hacker communities as well as from the Open Glam initiatives. Using this knowledge, we could think ways and incentives to engage more current and future artists in open practices. There are also other items to share than final artworks, such as sketches and documentation of studio practices, which could provide interesting insights into how artists work. Hackathons and workshops are also a great way to promote the use of open cultural content in a shared enthusiastic atmosphere. In such events, people with various backgrounds can meet, adding ideally diversity to the open community. Together with my colleagues, I've given lots of different kinds of DIY workshops, some of which included open images, videos and sounds. In my experience, formats such as animated GIFs work well, as they are playful, fairly quick to make and easy to share online. During the pandemic, we've also seen many charming reenactments of famous paintings, which people put together using objects that they found at home. It would be generally nice to see more open-ended exploration of the open collections without thinking too much of goals or practical applications. There is value in creative exploration itself. To facilitate this kind of activities, artists and designers could share their skills of looking at items from unconventional or surprising perspectives. And makers could share their vast knowledge of hands-on work and experimentation, which is equally important when developing an idea. Digital techniques such as machine learning offer interesting possibilities to explore large collections, but it would be still nice to see some use of the workbench, as hands are an essential part of being a homo sapiens. It can be a pleasure to get away from the screen and use a cordless drill for a while instead. One challenge in engaging younger generations with open content might be how to explain what open cultural content actually is. For someone who's grown up using just about everything that's available online, what we may call an open collection may not seem so open, but even limited and unnecessarily complicated. To bridge such generation gaps, we need to hear more opinions and ideas from young people beyond the traditional classroom settings, to let them teach us rather than the other way around. Lastly, I'd like to encourage people to get creative, not just with the open collections, but also with open licenses. We use the Creative Commons Attribution License a lot, but another one of our favorites is the Beerware License by Paul Henning Kamp. And it essentially says you can use the software freely, but if you would in person bump into the author one day, you are encouraged to buy them a beer. The license seems to work in reality, as we also got a couple of drinks by now. I also once made a DIY license for an online doodle archive called Creature Party, which I published with the help of my friend Katrin and my brother Tommy. This license is called Be Nice License, and it wishes that in return of using the images, one would do something nice for someone else, such as help with the groceries. In the end, many creators and makers aren't probably that much into complicated legal texts. They just like to share what they do and keep up a good atmosphere. Thank you for your attention. Bye!